everyone and welcome to this week's Spark Social Justice Online Series episode. This week I am so excited to be welcome to join by Layla from the Climate Coalition, uh, which is an organisation leading climate action in the UK to discuss campaigning and the climate crisis and hopefully provide you with some inspiration. So Layla, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited. Uh, um, so I think my first question is, I'm sure some people want to know about you and your journey and what led you to be involved with social action and social justice especially within the climate coalition fab thanks tom and just to say thank you so much for having me i'm so excited to be here um so like you said my name is Layla. i am 24 years old um, and i work for the climate coalition but it wasn't really a smooth um you know school sixth form career it's been a bit of a roller coaster so i will tell you a little bit about it i finished sixth form and had no idea what i wanted to do um so a really good friend from church has said oh do you know that all over the uk we have these retreat centers um and they provide workshops for young people um all over like all over the uk but the one there's one in um, canvey island that provide workshops for children in east london and essex um, you'd have to interview to do it, but my son's just done it and he said it's amazing. So I thought, okay, I'll apply. So I applied for that. I got it and it was one of the best years of my life. But as it was coming to the end, I was still none the wiser of what I wanted to do. So I know that you interviewed Sarah Barber before me. Um, so Sarah Barber actually um, said to me, well, if you're not sure what you want to do, CAFOD have this step into the GAP programme. And I thought, oh, another year. So my friends and family were a bit like, Layla, it's, it's time to go to university. It's time to adult. We don't need another year out. And I was like, oh, I don't know what I want to do. I don't want to just go in and do something for the sake of it. So I did have another year out. <laughs> and um, it was during that year that really cemented my passion for social justice. Um, and, you know, sh it showed me that 100% I want a career within uh, the NGO sector. And that was where my passion is. That's what I wanted to wake up every day and do. Um, so when I finished um, Step Into The Gap, I then went to university and studied sociology for three years. Um, and then on completion of that, I went and did um, Faith in Politics, which is a graduate scheme. And I worked, I went back to CAFOD. So I did a bit of a full circle and worked as their parliamentary assistant. Um, and on the graduate scheme, you have Fridays off and um, the Climate Coalition sits in Romero House. That's where um, Caffold staff are based. I mean, they were based before coronavirus. Um, and I just always saw a really small team just like buzzing around doing so much. Um, and I was really passionate about this sort of um, climate justice side of, you know, climate change. And I just wanted to get more involved. So on my Fridays, um, I would spend my time volunteering for the Climate Coalition and any any way I could help, I'd just say, like, just use me. I just really want to get involved. Um, and they did that. And then as my graduate scheme came to an end, I was then offered a role in the Climate Coalition. So it's it's been a little bit of a crazy journey to get to where I am now. Um, but that's how I ended up at the Climate Coalition. Wow. Quite a, quite a different, like, a all over the place journey but yeah it's great like you've got there now so um so like many young people find it very difficult to get inspired and i think people like draw inspiration and motivation from different places and different people or thoughts and things i know that i find i find that i'm most motivated when i'm trying to like prove someone wrong or when i'm under pressure to prove myself so what inspires or motivates you to do the work that you do um i think First and foremost are my two younger sisters. So I have um, Aisha and Sophia, and they are 13 and 15. Um, and I mentioned before, I grew up in East London and my nan brought all of us up. And I had a little bit of a turbulent upbringing. You know, thank God my sisters haven't had that. But, um, you know, they have grown up on an estate. They are growing up on an estate in East London. They've been through and seen a lot. And what motivates me every day and inspires me to just get up and, and do my job is that I want them to be able to, you know, see someone achieve whatever they want to achieve. 
you know, I say to them all the time, it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter what you've been through, if you put your mind to something, you can 100% achieve it. So that's one thing that really mo motivates me every day to just to get up um, and do what I do. But particularly working within the climate sector, I think what really inspires me is I spent three months, nearly th four months in Fiji. And while I was there, I lived with a family uh, and I, live, I was in a village that was really affected by Cyclone Winston. And one night we were sitting there and our family were telling us all about, you know, they thought they, they, thought they were going to die in this moment. People did die, family members died. Everything was absolutely destroyed. And, um, you know, they had just rebuilt only a few years from another cyclone that hit. And, you know, th these people I was living with for over a month and, you know, we called them our like, Fijian mum, dad and our siblings. And I, I really loved them. And to hear what they had to go through really broke my heart. Um, you know, I was aware that climate change, you know, was severely affecting people in the global south. But I think it's different when you live with these people and you and you, it's, you can see the devastating impacts. Um, so that really motivates me because, you know, not only are, are you know, our brothers and sisters feeling the effects right now in the global south, we're also feeling it not as severely, but we're feeling it within the UK. And I feel like people feel like it's such a far away thing that's going to happen. Like, don't worry. It may be one day, you know, maybe it's our grandchildren's problem. And that's just not the case. You know, the Climate Coalition, they produce reports every year for our campaign, Show the Love. And this year we produced a report on homes, climate change, how climate change affects homes. Um, and it's like devastating flooding within the UK and also the heat waves and how it affects our elderly. So I think, yeah, they're the two motivations. One, how it affects you know, people that I really love. And two, uh, I wanted to show my sisters that they can do whatever they want to do. Wow. Um, so that actually that leads quite nicely on to, so for people that are unaware of what the Climate Coalition is, um, could you tell us kind of what you do and what the Climate Coalition does in general? Yeah, absolutely. So the Climate Coalition, we're a coalition of um, over a hundred organisations. We have some really big ones such as Islamic Relief, CAFOD, um, the Women's Institute, and we also have like really small community groups. Um, so maybe like 10, 15 people in like stop climate, stop the climate emergency in Sunnydale and Ascot, climate friendly Bradford and Avon. So we have a real range of members. Um, and my job, I am campaigns executive within the team and I'm really outward facing. So I deal with everything to do with members, which I absolutely love because you can probably tell that I'm really chatty and I love just talking to people about everything and anything. Um, so, yeah, my role is to communicate with our members and make sure, you know, they really feed into our campaigns um, if, and they feel like they can shape them. We also always have really two big campaign moments throughout the year. So some of you watching may have been involved in the first ever virtual lobby that happened on Tuesday. Um, and it was absolutely massive. We had over 13,000 people sign up um, and over 200 and still counting MP meetings take place over Zoom. Um, and what we're working on right now is we're focusing on a green recovery. So obviously we really want to build back better after you know, this health crisis. And we want to ensure the government do implement the right policies to do so. Um, so we actually have a green recovery plan with seven key areas that we believe the government you know, must implement to ensure that we do build back better. Um, and I can, I can send you the link, Tom, so you can share it uh, after, after the chat. Yeah, that would be really useful. I think people would really like to get, like, get to know more and be involved in that. So yeah, I'll definitely put that in somewhere. Um, so I think that uh, we've touched on this a little bit before, but, um, so some young people think that enough action has been taken, so why should they be involved? So how, how truthful do you think that is? And do you think, or do you think more need, action needs to be taken? Do you think more, yeah, do you think more action needs to be taken to prevent the climate crisis? Um, absolutely. I mean, the same day as our virtual lobby, like we didn't know this was going to happen, but the Prime Minister actually made an announcement um, about how he's going to build back after coronavirus. Um, and it was really disappointing. You know, he really didn't mention a lot about how he was going to ensure that we have more green spaces, 
you know, people have really enjoyed during this pandemic, spending time within nature. It's so good for your mental health, but also the roads being clearer and being able to cycle. Like I'm from London and I'm petrified to, to cycle my bike on, on, on the roads, but I've absolutely loved it. Um, the first few months I was cycling everywhere. Um, and you know, people, people don't want to go back to where they couldn't do that before. And I think, to ensure that it needs as many voices from all across society to put pressure on the government and say, we don't want this, this is what we want. And I think it's always important to remember when you feel like, oh, there's enough being done or what can my little action do to, to change the climate crisis? Never ever think like that because it can do so much. You know, your MP was elected to represent you, despite whether they're, it's the party that you are a part of or that you support, they're still, elected to hear what you have to say so use your voice and you know if if you don't feel comfortable meeting with your mp you can write emails letters you know they have to reply um and you know the more constituents that show that they care the more action that they have to do so i think yeah it's so important to use your voice and never feel like your voice isn't big enough or enough because it really is and your voice could be that voice that's the tipping point or like one more person that changes the mp's mind yeah, I don't know if you um, know this, but when we were in, when I was back in school, one of the things that we arranged was um, the MP to actually come and visit um, to speak about these issues and things. And coming off the back of that, our local MP did like a, it was like a climate voice thing um, in the area of lots of schools. So yeah, as, as you say, it's, it's just one voice that could actually mm -hmm. make such a massive impact. But you, you you know, it might it might not even be your voice, but it, it could be, it could yeah. be. So it's it's just taking the chance, taking the time to kind of go out and do it to, that could really make the difference. And you, you could be the voice that, you know, changes everything. You never know. Yeah, absolutely. So throughout your work, what have been some of the main challenges you faced and how have you overcome those challenges? Um... I'd have to say, you know, I was in quite a bubble until I started my career two years ago. Um, I think I was in a real sort of safe haven. And then when I, you know, when I went into the big real world, um, I became really sort of self-conscious and had a bit of imposter syndrome when I was entering, you know, new spaces with professionals. Um, and it wasn't like me at all. I'm I would always describe myself as someone, someone who's, you know, really outspoken and very confident, but I was finding myself not wanting to speak in, in meetings and often like um, emailing my boss after to sort of say my ideas instead of actually um, voicing my opinion then and there. Um, and, I, and I think I was doing that because I was worried that people would first of all hear my accent or think I was maybe common or I don't know, just, just feel like I wasn't worthy to be in that space. And it really chipped away at me for quite a while. But it was, I think what allowed me to overcome that was having such an amazing uh, work, having such amazing work colleagues and an amazing boss, you know, that's, you know, always affirmed me and said, these ideas are valid. Whatever, you've got this job for a reason and don't ever feel afraid to voice your opinion. Um, I don't think imposter syndrome ever goes away. Um, I'd be lying to say like, I still don't have those moments now. But within my team at the Climate Coalition, um, is it, we're a small team and I feel so valued as a team member. But not only that, um, I don't get imposter syndrome within my team. You know, I, I feel like I do thrive in a smaller team than a, than a massive charity. Um, and there are still times where, you know, we might have wider coalition meetings where I get a little bit of anxiety and I get anxious and I think, oh, can I do this? And it's just, you know, I take a minute to sort of pray and say to myself, I've been given this job for a reason. I can do it. So I think if there's anyone listening that does have imposter syndrome, you know, don't ever allow yourself, don't ever allow that voice in your head to stop you from doing something. Hear the voice and do it anyway. That would be my advice. That's really good advice. I can, like, I can speak on that myself. Like, I feel like sometimes you feel like you're, like, not good enough or you feel like you're kind of, inferior to other people but actually you you know if you've been if you've been chosen to do something or if you're in, in something like 
share it because yeah. often like that is probably the, the like again that could be the thing that causes the change that could be the thing that's like you know it, it could be anything it's i think it's so important to kind of like use your voice where you can use it because you, you know especially if you've been given that like chance to be a part of something like why not use it because other people don't have that chance so yeah mm-hmm. and it, 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 you know everyone's different but mm. i think that's so important yeah. um and i think the more you share the easier it gets i mean yeah. you know even within lectures, I would find myself being really confident and sharing with all my peers. But it was that professional environment that would that would really make me anxious. And I'd get that, that imposter syndrome where I think, no, nope, I'm not saying anything. What if I say something and I sound so common or I sound so uneducated? Um, and it was just taking step by step, you know, each meeting saying something a little bit more to where I am now in a position where I do feel very comfortable to, you know, share my views and my opinions and share my ideas and say, I think this would work a little bit better if, and not feel worried that everyone would be like, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, I feel like I was like that in school. Like, I think within my lessons and things, I would be really, co- not confident, but I feel like I would be able to share my opinion or share anything and it wouldn't, I wouldn't feel judged by anyone. But then like going into a more professional environment, I feel like I have to kind of take a step back and think, you know, oh, what if I don't, what if people don't like that? Or what if people, mm. but over time, I've become sort of more accustomed to that environment and more like, able to speak and things so yeah I, I think people yeah I think that's important so a lot of people are watching um have been a part of the spark program pre-quarantine um and were just about to start up their own social justice groups um to start campaigning or fundraising um what practical advice would you give to those young people who are looking to do that or already starting or in the middle of preparing to do that um mm-hmm so that they can, or do you have any things that people could get involved in right now who perhaps mm. haven't been able to do that absolutely um so what i would say is if you're thinking about doing it do it and you know there's so many resources out there from all different charities of course i'm going to have to plug the climate coalition we have a community mobilizers pack that is you know nearly ready nearly going to be on our website and it's basically for people that want to do exactly what you said, Tom, you know, want to sort of mobilise their community, want to fundraise or even, you know, want to just bring a group of people together that can go and talk to their MP. You know, this community mobilisers pack will enable you to do that. It gives you all the steps, all the advice. It's really fab and that will be ready soon. But another charity that's doing fab things is um, Cathod um, and they've got their Summer of Hope campaign. And this is a really easy one to get involved in because all they're asking you to do is something that you were meant to do over the summer. So that could be if you're meant to go to a festival, for example, um, that money that you were either going to, that you were going to spend on the ticket or that you would have spent like getting all your camping gear and whatever else, you know, donate that to Cathod, but still have like, still try and do that sort of invite that festival feel within your garden and your, with your family. Or if you wanted to actually do something to fundraise money, it could be like you would cycle, to Glastonbury and raise money that way or Reading or wherever you were going to go. Um, so yeah, there are campaigns this summer that are already happening that you can just piggyback and get involved in. Um, but I think if you're, you know, it all depends. There are campaigns that are tailored to what you want to do. So if you do want to speak to your MP, um, you know, there's the MPC scheme, which is MP correspondence scheme. And that's with CAFOD as well. And they train you up and you can go and speak to your MP that way. Um, but there's also, like I said, the Community Mobilisers Pack and the Summer of Hope. And my advice would just be to um, absolutely go for it. And if, if, you've got, if you're already part of a community group or like your, your parish or football group or dance group, it's already, you've got that group there. And it's just a case of saying, you know, here's this campaign. Do you want to do it with me? Perfect. I just want to add one more thing in. Um, you said you did step into the gap um, and I'm sure some people watching this are actually getting quite interested in doing that because we've had quite a bit over the few weeks. Um, could you tell us a bit about your experience on that as well? Yeah, absolutely. So step into the gap. I moved to Lancashire. Obviously, I'm born and bred East London and I moved to Lancashire at 19. It was absolutely terrifying, but I loved it. Um, it was so different to anything I ever experienced. Um, and I wouldn't have had the opportunity. You know, I never would have moved to Lancashire if it wasn't for this reason, um, for stepping into the gap. 
And while I was there, I was a chaplain and I was delivering social justice sessions in a primary school, which I loved. I really loved it. And then I also went to Zimbabwe for a month where I got to witness Cafford's work, which obviously was a real highlight. And then when I came back from Zimbabwe, it was just all about sort of showing primary schools and secondary schools where their money is spent. So, and also like just giving workshops. And um, so for example, while I was in Zimbabwe, we met a group of women who before a Cafford pump was um, installed within their community, they would have to walk for about three or four hours just to collect water and they'd collect it from Lake Kariba which you know had crocodiles and it just really was dangerous um, and you know we had to sort of experience what they used to go through so these women put this bucket of water on our head that was so heavy and I remember thinking I can't even walk for two minutes how have they done this for hours and you know they were just absolute boss women they had babies either side and they were just killing it and because it's what they had to do to survive um and I remember coming back to primary schools and saying like, I was filling up not even half of what these women would have to carry and I was getting these primary school kids to carry it on their head <laughs> and it just wouldn't they couldn't even pick it up and I think it was actually you know sort of feeling what people would have to go through stayed with them and they couldn't believe it they, they were talking about it like weeks after um and they really wanted to do something about it. They didn't want anyone else anywhere in the world to have to experience that. So yeah, it, the year was a, an amazing year. It really opened my eyes. And I'd recommend it to anyone that, you know, even if you do know what you want to, to do at uni and you're going to go and maybe you want a career break before you go um, and start applying for jobs, it's something that you can do after or before. Perfect, thank you. Um, well, unfortunately that's the end of this episode and I'm so happy that this has happened because it was so good thank you for joining <laughs> us Layla I'm sure people are so inspired by your journey and your work and the climate coalition and everything that we've talked about today it's been so amazing thank you um if there are any links and things we'll leave them in the description so you can go and watch that um I believe we've got a video Layla do you want to explain a bit about that as well yeah absolutely so there's a video that I um filmed for CAFOD that it was about maybe six months ago now. Um, and so all the people that I've mentioned in this video, like my amazing Nan and my two younger sisters, um, they're featured in this film. And it just sort of puts a, puts a few uh, names to faces so you can build a bit of a better picture of what I've been talking about. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think that might actually come at the end of the episode. I'm not sure. If not, it'll be in the description so you can go and watch it. Um, and if people want to contact you later, do you have um, things... Uh, point of contact that you want to give out or yeah absolutely I'll give you my email address my personal email address so anyone can contact me if they've got any further questions or just want any advice about anything I've spoken about perfect we can put that um we can link that as well so yeah thank you so much for joining us this has been really good thanks Layla um and for all of you watching at home if you want to get any more information on anything that we've been talking about or just want to get some inspiration you can go follow us on twitter and on facebook and subscribe to our youtube channel for further episodes in the future um i think that about covers it thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week hopefully thank you bye bye